Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for special moments like this one. They're all special, Father. And they are gifts from you to your children. Times to relax. Be washed over by the word. To be cleansed from the filth of this world as it clings to us. Father, we're just so grateful for all your good work in us as you sanctify us to your glory. Father, we just pray for those that are not able to be with us this morning, that you heal them, that you restore them, that you return them to the fold so that we might fellowship with them in this way. We pray also for those that are still lost in this world without hope, that they be humbled, repent, and receive saving faith before it's too late. We are most grateful and thankful, of course, for your son's work on that cross 2,000 years ago to make moments like this a reality for us. And just ask for your blessings on this morning's message. May it be edifying for our souls. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. All right, part 144, the book of Hebrews. Today's going to be a little different um, since we didn't have service on Thursday. Um, Scott, I'm happy for you. You got some time to rest, right? Good. Um, so I'll spend a little extra time reviewing. Normally Thursdays are our review days. Um, I'll spend a little extra time this morning reviewing Sunday's message before we press on further. Um, on that note, though, uh, we also have blogs that are a critical part of this ministry that I hope you all read. Uh, last week's blog, again, we're reviewing. Last week's blog was focused on one specific attribute of not just good leadership, not adequate leadership, but great leadership namely empathy. And so from that blog, The Empathetic Leader, I quoted an excerpt here, great leaders are servants first, and a servant's first order of business is to tend to others. As such, they are thrilled when others succeed and pained by their failures, a la Romans 12, 15. We call this empathy empathy. Great leaders are also motivated to help others in time of need. So these types of individuals, and it's not a, look, it's not some unique calling. It's not something that, you know, one person has access to over another. It's just an issue of humility. It's an issue of servanthood. We all are leaders at some or in some aspect of our lives. So don't think I'm talking lofty here. This is about you. There's a reason why the Spirit has me teaching these principles, because you're all leaders in one way or another. So take it to heart. Great leaders are also motivated to help others in time of need, which means they're always on the lookout, sort of vigilant. What's going on? Um, in my periphery? What's going on in, say, the body of Christ? Are there needs that are not being met? Are there folks that, I mean, minimally need our prayer? The greatest leader of all time, of course, is Jesus Christ. Go to Hebrews 4.15. Hebrews 4.15. So the greatest leader of all time is Jesus Christ. No surprise there. He's our, as you might say, a prototype when it comes to leadership. Hebrews 4.15 For we do not have a high priest, this is Jesus Christ, of course, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every aspect or every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. That's the difference between him and us. Yet without sin. Verse 16, let us then with confidence 
draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And so our Lord, Jesus Christ, is always available to us in time of need. So let us draw near to the throne of grace. And the Holy Spirit has a fair amount to say on the topic of grace once again this morning. But he is the greatest leader of all. And he's profoundly gracious in ways that we can't even fathom, to be honest, right? Great leadership also bears good fruit. Fruit that is often identifiable due to great leadership's bias for action. So there are a lot of people, I think, in this world that... um, If you didn't know any better, you'd say, wow, they sound like they might be a great leader. But they're armchair warriors. They sort of talk from on high or from a distance. And they never roll up their sleeves and get involved, right? There's no real fruit that's identifiable because they don't have a bias for action. But great leaders have a bias for action. Oftentimes it's not popular. But nonetheless, they are compelled to action. The other excerpt from the blog titled The Empathetic Leader was this. True empathy implies sacrificial love. Sacrifice implies action. Words are not real sacrifice. Actions are. There's movement. True empathy implies sacrificial love. Great leaders put The welfare of others over their own personal advancement is not their objective. Love doesn't motivate that way. 1 Corinthians 13. If you know anything about biblical love, you know that it's not about you. It's about others. Leadership, then, doesn't just talk the talk. It walks the walk. While a, quote, good leader may point a finger in the right direction, a great leader will say, follow me. In other words, I'm not just going to point from on high. I'm going to get out of my armchair, my place of rest, let's say, and I'm going to help you get there. I'm going to lead the way. Follow me. What does that imply? Movement, action, activity, behavior. Great leaders will say, follow me. Isn't that what Jesus told the apostles? Yep. So great leaders don't just say the right things. They do the right things. There's usually a pretty sizable chasm between those two things. There's a lot of people that talk an awful lot. But when push comes to shove, they don't ever really do anything. They just say, do that over there, and they got a big point and finger. Do that over there. But they don't take the time to actually lead people in those directions. Really good talkers sometimes. Great leaders manifest what Paul wrote in Romans 12. Go to Romans 12, 9. They manifest this. Romans 12, 9. There are other attributes, I believe, that are tied to great leaders. Maybe one of the biggest ones of all is authenticity. Maybe one of my favorite words in the English language, authenticity. What does it say in Romans 12, 9? Let love be what? Genuine, authentic, in other words. Don't just be lip service. Let love be genuine. And as I've taught a bazillion times from behind this pulpit, true love cannot help but express itself. It will always bear good fruit. It can't help itself. It's compelled. Let love then be genuine. In other words, be authentic. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo, if there's not an 
action verb here. I don't know where one is. Outdo, that's an action verb. One another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. You see the difference? Don't be slothful in zeal. Don't just talk a big game, but then be lazy. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Allah, our current principle from the empathetic leader blog. Right? That's what true leaders do. They rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep because their empathy is authentic. They're not faking it. It's not lip service. They are authentic individuals. And that's what makes them great. Verse 16. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, haughty, arrogant, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all, and if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. And that caused me to take pause, because I even catch myself sometimes um, not wanting to do that necessarily. You know, when someone's like sort of pricking at that nerve, you know, twing, right? We all have open nerves that uh, are our least favorite things, and kind of like, don't pluck that nerve. It's really hard to maintain that vector of being peaceable when someone's plucking a certain nerve that's already open, vibrating, and ready to pounce. If you know anything about living peaceable, it's this. It takes work to maintain peace in a world that is filled with human fleshes. Is that fair to say? <laughs> of course. So you think about peace and you think about just, I don't know, I think you could over-rotate and think that it's just something, peace just means you get to, once again, lay in your armchair and do nothing. But that's not how this works. Maintaining peace takes work. And a great leader pursues peace wants peace. And as far as it depends on them, they're peaceable. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Therefore, you can say, great leaders lead by example. Great leaders lead by example. Do you throw down the hockey gloves when someone plucks that nerve? Or do you take it on the chin? Do you do the right thing, or do you do nothing? Or even worse, do you go in the opposite direction? Do something bad, return evil for evil. Great leaders lead by example. And their shining moments aren't when they're standing, say, behind a pulpit. It's when they are stricken with something, severe, let's say. There's a million different ways to be stricken with something severe. How do they handle it? How do they respond under that kind of pressure? Because you can, they can drop the hockey gloves and go at it with someone's flesh, or they can transcend the situation and respond with grace and class and honor. That's what great leaders do. They don't sit in their armchairs and moan and groan and add to the fray. So this means, for example, when they are attacked, it is quite possible that the best response is silence. You can actually do silence. With the advent of social media and people sitting behind computer screens with unnatural 
or inflated bravado, have you noticed how difficult it seems to be for the average person, Christians included, to keep their mouths shut? You ever notice that? I remember, I remember when Facebook, Facebook first came out. And it, I mean, I was like, wow, this is cool. You get to do, and everything's like, oh, man, I haven't seen this person in like too many years. Everybody's like, yay. And then I was like, gig, 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 gig. Right? And then all of a sudden, he's like, oh, what? did that person just throw a barb at me? Did they just like, what's going on right now? Like, what happened to all the fun? The human flesh. The human flesh ruins everything. And then it's hard to keep your mouth shut. He's like, you just, you just dissed me in public for all these people to see? And then people are like, oh, yeah, you go, man. Click, click, like, 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 like. And it's like, wait, are you like what they're doing to me right now? Yeah, like, 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 like. What? The whole gang's against you, right? And you're like, mm-hmm. I'm going to flame somebody. It's difficult to keep your mouth shut. One of the reasons I got off of Facebook was because the riffraff was just too much. Uh, call me weak, I don't know. Or call me just irritated and just be like, it's not worth it. Being an Orthodox pastor in the public is like being a sheep being led to slaughter. So a man like that, like myself, has two options. Either be lured into evil where no one wins. If I go fisticuffs with somebody in public, no one wins. Do you realize that? Even if it's another Christian. No one wins just because they're being weak morons doesn't mean I need to become a weak moron. No one wins. The rest of the world is watching two so-called Christians, people that are supposed to be representing Christ, go at it. It doesn't matter who started it. So there's that option. Or you walk away and leave it up to the Lord. A la Romans 12, 19, where he says, Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Those are your options. One goes low and one goes high. One damages the name of Christ, one elevates the name of Christ. So me personally, I chose to walk away from Facebook based on guidance from Holy Scripture and the supreme example of Jesus Christ who walked away when the stakes were much, much higher. (laughs) Go to Isaiah 53, 7. Isaiah 53, verse 7. Greatest leader of all time. Could have wiped everybody out with a word. Anybody who ever harmed him personally. Could have wiped them out on the spot. Could have called on many, many angels to do the work for him if he so desired. Look at the stakes here. Isaiah 53, 7, referring to Jesus Christ. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not His mouth. We can't even get by social media. And here they are setting him up to murder him, and he didn't even open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth." So the next time someone attacks you personally when you didn't do anything wrong 
Think of Jesus. More times or more often than not, the best thing to do is keep your mouth shut. And if you don't trust yourself, then remove yourself from the situation. Dust your feet off. You can do that. That's something you can do to maintain the peace. Say, okay, that's your opinion. You're not my judge. The Lord's my judge. Again, great leaders lead by example. If you have children, it's a wonderful way to show them how to manage stress. How did mommy respond? How did daddy respond in that situation? Did they lose their marbles? Did they drop the hockey gloves? Did they go at it? Did they lose their... Because that's what I'll do when I grow up. No, you're setting them up for pain and suffering. Again, great leaders lead by example. We just saw under the most extreme circumstances, the Lamb of God, who was to be slain, kept his mouth shut because it was the right thing to do. Is that always the case? No, it's the same guy who flipped over tables in the temple. But that comes with wisdom. I'll say this. It's a lot harder to lead by example than by mouth. Is that fair? A lot harder to lead by example than by mouth, by lip service. Talk is cheap. So if you agree with God's word, then do it. Don't just talk about how awesome it is. And we're all guilty of this. I teach these messages. And I'll be like, man, that was, a, that was a fun message to teach. The Spirit was had so much to say. And I was really convicted by this one aspect, let's say, of this message. Oh, it was awesome. And then I walk out the door, and the first thing I do is that thing I'm just taught against. Does that make sense? You guys never done that? You guys ever done that before? I do it all the time. It's horrible. I'm a pastor, and I fail all the time. All the time. So these, these lessons, these messages, they're for all of us. And the Spirit's saying, if you agree with God's Word, then do it. Don't just talk about how awesome it is. Fair enough? All right, we've got to change gears. But before we get back to our primary passage in Hebrews, the Spirit gave us a friendly reminder uh, last week, again, I'm reviewing a little bit more than I would because of Thursday's, uh, Thursday's class being canceled. That reminder was something that I know a lot of you know, that saints, the word saint in the Bible, according to Holy Scripture, refers to all believers in Christ, not just the so-called remarkable ones. If you're an ex-Roman Catholic, this may be news to you. But I'm glad you're hearing it. There's one less thing to be riddled with. One less lie to be weighed down by. Oh, I'll never measure up. It's exactly what religion wants you to think. Get on the little gerbil wheel. Chase the carrot. i got to be good enough to get into heaven. I'll never be like Saint... I don't know. You pick a name. Saint Rufus... Right? Sally? I don't know. I don't even know how many there are. It's like my grandma. You want to have a stupid joke? My, every time I went by a cemetery, my grandma would say, Hey, Ed, how many people are dead in that cemetery? I'd be like, oh. I said, I don't know. She said, all of them. <laughs> how many people are saints? All believers. You don't have to count. <laughs> right? In any case, the writer of Hebrews had written to this congregation 2,000 years ago referring to the doctrine of the persistent saint. The persistent saint. And those things are intrinsic to one another. If you're persistent in the faith, 
then you're a saint. If you're a saint, then you're persistent in the faith. You, there's no division there. If you're born again, if God gives you a new heart, if you're considered a new creature in Christ, then you can't help but persist. You may wander. You may have bad weeks, bad months even, who knows. But you always come back because he never lets you out of his hand. He may let you meander for a little while to teach you a lesson. To say, you see what happens? Remember all those messages I taught not that long ago about being in the safe harbor? And you get a little cocky and you pull up anchor. Start going outside the breaker. <laughs> and you're out in the sea like, oh, God. And what does he do? He always brings you back into safe harbor. Why does he let you out in the first place? Because you're dumb. And you need to learn lessons because you're a dumb sheep. And the only way we learn most of the time is by failure. Is that fair? Yeah, because do you ever listen to what I say? No. <laughs> do you? No. Like, oh, that, that, sounds, that sounds just right, Pastor. Um, I don't believe you. So I'm going to do it myself. And I'm going to come back with bloody elbows and bloody knees and a bruised ego and say, you know what, dude? You were right. I don't know. You want to see my scars? The doctrine of the persistent saint. Go to Hebrews 6.11. Hebrews 6.11. <clears throat> they are one and the same. Hebrews 6.11. And we desire, each one of you, to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end. A reference to persistence. Verse 12, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, again, evidence of persistent faith, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So, when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things, and this is the promise and the oath that guarantee it, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So, Last time, we began to look at the first two parts in this passage, or the first of two parts in this passage, and the first being the expository part, where the writer reminds this congregation of God's promise to Abraham. So let's review that quickly, since we covered it in more detail last time. Again, look at verse uh, Hebrews 6.13. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. So last week we went back to Genesis 15, if you remember, to locate the promise the writer was referring to. I want to catch the highlight reel here for review's sake. Go to Genesis 15.1. Hold your thumb there. Go to Genesis 15.1. We'll just catch the highlight reel. Genesis 15, 1. I started reading Genesis again. I think I'm on chapter 4 now, as of this morning. Such a phenomenal book. It never gets boring because every time I go back, after being, say, in the New Testament for a little while, something new opens up. Some new aha moment occurs. Something I hadn't thought about before. Some nuance. Uh, often it's, it has to do with the fall, even, believe it or not. In any case, Genesis 15, 1, 
It's a reference to the promise back in Hebrews 6. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Quote, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. Jump to verse 5. Verse 5, And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven, and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. Jump to verse 18. Verse 18. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land, and so on and so forth. So this so-called Abrahamic covenant refers to the promises that God gave Abraham regarding land, progeny, and blessing. We also took pause to note that this covenant was unconditional, since it is upheld by God unilaterally versus bilaterally. In other words, it's upheld based on the word of God, which is, think about it, a really good thing. In other words, the keeping of the covenant depends wholly on God's integrity to his own word. Is there a better type of covenant? Do you want it to depend on your word? <laughs> Go to, back to our primary passage, Hebrews 6.13. Hebrews 6.13. So that's what we noted regarding this promise that the God who cannot lie made a promise to Abraham. And how does that relate to this audience that this writer is writing to and even us now? Hebrews 6.13, For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. And what is he, the writer doing here? It's pretty obvious, I hope. Our great hope for eternal salvation is God's integrity. This is the ultimate point that the writer is getting at here. He's using another example, but he's saying, look, it's the same God. The same God who promises Abraham here without question to be filled, fulfilled, the promises to be fulfilled is the same God whose promises to us are without question to be fulfilled. Same God. So let's go to the passage the Spirit took us to last time. Go to John 3.16. John 3.16. What about our promise of salvation? So we saw an instance of God's promise to Abraham. We can be sure of it coming to pass, what about this same God and his promises to us about our salvation? John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him, there is a prerequisite condition, whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And that's the promise kept by God's integrity. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. In other words, not everybody is saved. For everyone who, is, who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works be exposed. 
But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. And as Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 clearly states, it is by grace through faith that we are saved. Just like God's grace poured forth through Abraham's faith, God's grace pours forth through our faith. The true mind bender here is that God is the one who gives repentance and faith and the blessings by grace. <laughs> you say, wait a minute. So he gives, he gives repentance, he gives faith, he gives salvation. Um, what's left for us to do? Well, regarding salvation, nothing. That's the whole point of the doctrine of grace, my friends. A key point that should be no shocker for any of us. Grace is no longer grace if we must work for it. If God says, I'm going to save you by my grace, then you have nothing to do with it, lest you might boast. Hmm. Go to Romans 4.1. Romans 4.1. Grace is no longer grace if we must work for it, people. Romans 4.1 What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about. But not before God. In other words, if Abraham was able to do enough good stuff to make his way into heaven, let's say, that God would say, okay, you're good enough there, young chap. I'll take you. No. He would have something to boast about. You see? If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? It says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. That's a reference back to Genesis 15, 6, which we read. Verse 4, now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. And that's a reference back to Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Again, all the Spirit wants to emphasize here this morning why we went to Romans 4 is to just reiterate grace is no longer grace if we must work for it. And if salvation is by grace alone, then guess what? We don't work for it. It's not a works program. It's nothing we do to get into heaven. There's no religious anything that we must do to get into heaven. It's by the grace of God. And if there was any kind of, even 1.0.0001% work that had to be done by you, it would no longer be grace. Because then you would say, well, <laughs> at least I did 0 0.00001 amount of work. I did something. Then it would no longer be grace. Grace is no longer grace if we must work for it. Conclusion, all aspects of God's salvific plan are by grace and therefore are His to bestow. So I'll ask you a simple question. Where did Abraham's faith come from? Where did your faith come from? Where did both Abraham's and your salvation come from? 
The answer to all three questions, of course, is God. You are dead. Dead as a doornail. Totally depraved. Polluted. And you say, well, I wasn't that polluted. I was kind of a nice person. Okay, so let's just say for argument's sake, you were only 1% polluted. I love Scott's example. Okay? I'm going to be gross at Sunday morning. Okay? This is Scott, not me. So we've got a problem with it. So this is you, right? And you put 1% of sewage in here. Are you going to drink it? But it's only 1%. Is not this whole thing polluted now? Yeah. It's no good. You, there's no part of you that can contribute to saving faith because you show up polluted. You show up depraved, as the Bible would say, spiritually dead. You are incapable of it. Can a dead person laying on the floor do anything? Not last time I checked. They're dead. So the answer to all those questions, faith, salvation, repentance even, if you want to throw that in, where do they come from? The grace of God. And here's the thing. That's great news. If it were up to us to somehow contribute to our own salvation, guess what? We'd be in big trouble. You show up dead, and someone says, listen, as if you could hear, listen, if you could just crawl, all right, you're right there, if you could just crawl off the stage, you get to go to heaven. But you're dead. How much crawling is going to be done? Guess you need someone else, huh? Guess you need someone else's help to get there. That's the whole point. So this was the case with the congregation the writer of Hebrews was addressing. He was sending out several reminders. We have confidence in our salvation because we have confidence in God's ability to save us and keep us saved. In other words, salvation itself, being saved and staying saved, is a promise from God, right? And if you receive that promise, the benefits, the blessing of that promise, then rest assured, you're saved. There should be no doubts. Let's check out one more passage before we head on back to our primary passage, and then I've got to close. Go to John 10.22. John 10.22. I know, I know, some of you are like, ah, I just don't, don't like that. I don't like it. You say you love grace, but then you don't love grace because part of you is like, but, you know, I kind of like the idea of me doing something because that makes me special. That makes me better than the next person. That makes me better than my neighbor. Well, what does that sound like? Why don't you just go right back to religion then? If you're just trying to be better than the next person, just go back to the religion. There's a lot of religious institutions around that teach garbage doctrine, that don't teach the grace of God. So don't say you love God's grace and then reject it in practice. Don't say you love God's grace and then say, but eh, I need to do a little something. I need to be a little better than my neighbor. No, that's the wrong motivation. That's a religious motivation. That's not holy. That's actually unholy. Look at John 10, 22. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, 
How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. They were very religious, they were very intelligent, they were very learned, very educated, but Jesus flat out told them, you're not one of my sheep. And then he, he goes on to explain it. He says, my sheep hear my voice. If you're here this morning and you're saved, or maybe you're in the process of being saved, you hear Jesus' voice, and you're coming to him. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Don't overcomplicate it. Don't overcomplicate it. It's literally that simple. Because you don't follow me. You don't even believe me because you're not one of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, they know, we know each other, and they follow me. And then what does he say he does? Look at verse 20, 28. He says, I give them eternal life. Not you, religious people. Not you who think you're working to get into heaven. I give my sheep eternal life. And they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. Why? That's his promise. That's what eternal life is. God never reneges on a promise like that. He doesn't give someone, say John 3.16, he doesn't give someone who believes eternal life and then go, well, you've been naughty, so I'm taking it back. Once saved, always saved. No one will snatch them out of my hand. They are mine. Sounds awfully possessive, doesn't he? That's a really good thing. My Father, look at verse 29, who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand either. I and the Father are one. He was establishing his deity there. In other words, I have the same power as my Father in heaven. We're both God. No one's going to snatch my sheep out of my hand. He's the great shepherd. Any wolf that comes in, and like I said earlier, maybe the wolf distracts one of the sheep for a little while because we're dumb. And we go chasing after him. Maybe we even get a little religious for a while because we lose our wits. The, old, the vestiges of old religion come in. He never lets them go. Ugh. Gotta go get them. There they come with their skinned knees and skinned elbows and their bruised ego. But I'm taking them back. Why? Because no one will snatch them out of my hand. I have the power. I can say that. No one is able to snatch his sheep out of Jesus's or the Father's hand. How's that for a promise? Isn't that lovely? How's that for a promise? Hmm. So not only did he do all the work to make you a sheep, he says, I'm never going to let you go either. The all-powerful, omnipotent God Holy, sovereign God of the universe says, you're mine. You hear my voice? I do. Then follow me. Let's go. And what do you do? Ah, that was a bad sheep, wasn't it? That was a sick sheep. <laughs> right? I'm going to go over here in the thicket and get hung up and say, Jesus, I'm stuck again. Yeah. That, that one should be familiar to you by now. 
right? And you shame, you know, the red face. It should be, but apparently I'm a slow learner. <laughs> the good news, no one will ever snatch them, snatch you out of his hand. If you are his sheep, no one. That's really good news. So how's that for a promise? Just like no one could have ever snatched Abraham from the Lord, no one will ever be able to snatch any believer from him. So rest on that. The principle, again, is we have confidence in our salvation because we have confidence in God's ability to save us and keep us saved. Now, let's take all that back to our primary passage, and I'll close. Go to Hebrews 6.17. Hebrews 6.17. This is really good news, is it not? What's the gospel mean? What's another word? two words for the gospel. The good news. Well, that's really good news, is it not? God takes all the responsibility for saving and keeping saved. Thank God it's not up to us, because we would fail. We would fail. We're too fickle. Hebrews 6.17 So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable in which two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. Same God, right? We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner uh, place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf as the high priest, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Remember what we studied with Melchizedek. That just means his ministry never has no beginning or no end. It's eternal. So be encouraged, my friends. If God has promised that you are saved, then guess what? You are saved forever and ever. He's never, ever going to let you go. How's that for good news? Amen? All right, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning, for truth that sets us free. Thank you for comforting us. Thank you for reminding us of your love, your grace, and your mercy. Father, we're so grateful for all that you do in our lives. We just ask for your patience as well as you continue to sanctify us. And we do stray as sheep, Father. It's embarrassing to admit it. It's shameful in its own way. But as that is the backdrop, may that elevate our gratitude for all that you do for us. We just ask for blessings as we take the things we've learned back to the privacy of our own souls, to our families even, and your will be done to a world that needs the truth so desperately. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen.